President. The Republican leader. Are we in a quorum call? We are. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Anyone who happened to be watching the Senate floor a little earlier today got a taste of why, in the midst of a national jobs crisis, Americans are still in danger of being slammed by one of the biggest tax hikes in history. While the U.S. military is today at risk of cuts that would devastate national security, and while there's now a very good chance another major ratings agency will downgrade our nation's credit, there's a reason all these things may actually happen, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with Republicans. The nation is at risk of entirely avoidable economic calamity because the President of the United States and the Democrats who control the Senate would rather spend their time picking apart Paul Ryan and his budget plan, which the House has already passed, than producing one of their own. They'd rather sit on the sidelines and hope people focus on the other guy's attempts to solve our most pressing domestic problems than bother to do anything about them themselves. This has been the Democratic M.O. for two long years. And it's really a disgrace. Later today, the House will pass a six-month continuing resolution to fund the government beyond the end of the month. Why? Well, because Democrats refuse to do the basic work of government. The Democratic Senate hadn't passed a budget in more than three years. This year, they haven't passed a single appropriations bill. For two years, have done, Democrats have done nothing, nothing but cast blame. Now, the law says the Democrats have to pass a budget. A simple majority can pass a budget. The law has been ignored. The President's proposed a budget of his own. They've opposed that one as well. The nation's just three and a half months away from going off a fiscal cliff, and they actually seem to welcome it. Because their overriding goal isn't to help the American people find work, it isn't to get a handle on the debt, it isn't to give small businesses a boost, it's to make government even bigger than it already is. And they're perfectly willing to let the country plunge into an even deeper economic mess to ensure they get the bigger government they want. That's how extreme and Washington Democrats have become. They're on an ideological crusade. They spent the first two years of this presidency putting their policies in place, and when they lost their big majorities in Congress, they decided to sit on their hands rather than change their approach as all of these challenges built and built and built. For two years, this president got absolutely everything he wanted legislatively, aided by giant majorities in both houses of Congress and goaded on by a chief of staff who told him to brush aside any pleas for bipartisanship. He spent two years putting into place the big government agenda that he and his liberal allies had dreamed of, an agenda so extreme that their biggest challenge was making sure members of their own party didn't defect. And the results of those efforts are clear for all to see. Unemployment's been above 8% for 43 straight months. Growth is an anemic 1.5%, the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. The federal debt is a stratospheric $16 trillion. A full 15% of Americans are now on food stamps. The Census Bureau said just yesterday that household incomes have declined every year of the Obama administration, and one out of six Americans are living in poverty. And the labor participation rate, the percentage of those who can work that are actually working, is at its lowest point in decades. If you count people who've given up looking for work, unemployment's above 11 percent, not the 8 percent we read about. These are the grim, grim realities of the Obama economy. And make no mistake, the framework for it was laid in 2009 and 2010. So yes, 
President Obama and Governor Romney have different philosophies on how to lead America back to prosperity. But the biggest difference is this. One of them's had four years to implement his vision. And it should be obvious to everyone that that's been a total failure. It's failed to lift us out of a jobs crisis. It's helped prevent the type of recovery that we all know is entirely possible. Yet all we get from the president or from Democrats in Congress is feel-good rhetoric. Attacks on Republicans who are actually working to solve our problems and political show votes that are deliberately designed to fail. Blame the other guy, and maybe people won't notice your own refusal to lead or the implications of your own vision. Because make no mistake, in order to fund the government this president wants, there would be no choice but to go after the very middle class he claims, claims to be fighting for. That's the dirty little secret behind the president's vision for America. That's the math he didn't mention in Charlotte. And that's the real story about what's been going on around here. For two long years, the president and Democrats in Congress laid the foundation for the economy we're in right now. They were so sure it would work that the president said if it didn't, he wouldn't deserve re-election. Well, it didn't. So for the last two years, Republicans in Congress have done everything we could to convince the president to go in a different direction, to change course. He didn't. He doubled down on the same failed policies, and when he wasn't able to get them through Congress, he blamed Republicans for the consequences. Well, blaming us for the results of his policies is almost as ridiculous as concluding that the vision behind them will be any more successful over the next four years than it has been over the last four years. It's time for Democrats from the president on down to stop blaming others and to start leading. Our problems are too serious and our challenge is too urgent to wait another day to act. And Mr. President, on another matter, tomorrow the Librarian of Congress, uh, Dr. Jim Billington, will mark 25 years on the job, and so I'd like to just say a few words of congratulation in honor of his service. Dr. Billington has enjoyed a distinguished uh, career. He's a Rhodes Scholar, earned his doctorate from Oxford, served in the Army, and taught history at Harvard and at Princeton. He's a renowned author and a Russian scholar, advising numerous members of Congress, administration officials, and even presidents. Dr. Billington's tenure at the Library of Congress has been exemplary. His most significant contribution is certainly his vision to bring the Library of Congress into the 21st century by digital, digitalizing its collection. Because of his actions, Dr. Billington has expanded the Library of Congress reach into thousands of educational institutions and millions of homes here and throughout the world. Under Dr. Billington's leadership, the Library of Congress has strengthened and flourished. So today we honor and we thank Dr. Jim Billington for an outstanding job leading the Library of Congress for the past 25 years. We wish him continued success and thank him for a lifetime of service to inspiring and educating others. Dr. Billington, congratulations. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
The pending business in the Senate is the jobs bill for veterans. A story in the Associated Press says that a federal judge has temporarily blocked enforcement of a new insider trading law that would require nearly 30,000 federal workers to disclose details about their financial tr transactions on the Internet. A U.S. district judge issued a temporary preliminary injunction today that bars a law called the Stock Act from being enforced on executive branch employees at least until November. That injunction does not affect members of Congress and their staffs. They still have to comply with the disclosure rules. Mr. President. Senator from North Dakota. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to uh, speak if, in, if as in morning business. The Senate is in a quorum call. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be dispensed with and that Without I be allowed to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, all week uh, my Democrat colleagues here in the Senate have been coming to the floor and using scare tactics and demagoguery on the so-called Ryan budget. And of course, what they're referring to is the budget that was passed by the House of Representatives months ago. And it's, I suppose, uh, fair anytime you produce something to have that criticized and critiqued and scrutinized and looked at and discussed. Uh, but it seems at the same time that if you were going to attack the product that somebody else had put forward, that the natural follow-up question would be, so what are you proposing? Where is your budget proposal? And I think it begs the question, Mr. President, on behalf of the American people, that the Democrats here in the Senate who want to attack the House passed budget haven't produced a budget of their own. Now, it's been 1,200, over 1,200 days, 1,232 days, I think, to be precise, that we have not considered a budget here on the United States Senate. And just for those who, uh, who are trying to do that arithmetic in their minds right now, that's uh, three years and four months. Three years and four months without a budget in the United States Senate. That at the same time that we continue to get bad news about the economy. This week we received news that Moody's uh, intends, if we end up going over the fiscal cliff next year, to downgrade America's credit rating. That would follow with other credit uh, agencies, rating agencies that have already uh, made that assumption about the American economy and the American fiscal situation. We also received uh, notice last week that the World Economic Forum had downgraded America's global competitiveness. When President Obama took office uh, in January of 2009, the world was ranked first, first in the world when it comes to global competitiveness. 
Uh, we dropped down to fourth or fifth, I think, here in the last year or two. But just in the last couple of weeks now, the World Economic Forum has dropped the United States even further. We are now seventh in the world when it comes to global competitiveness. And the reasons they cite for that are many. But it really comes back to the basic issues of spending and debt and taxes and regulations and red tape and the cost of doing business in this country. And it seems like, Mr. President, that the Democrat solution to that is to tax more so that we can spend more, raise taxes to grow government. That seems to be the only solution that the other side uh, is willing to put forward. Now, I say that when I say that's the only solution uh, because that's what we hear coming out of the White House in terms of the so-called fiscal cliff, and in terms of the, uh, uh, the response to dealing with the sequester. Well, we could do away with the sequester if we just had more revenues. If, if Washington could just raise more money, more tax revenues from the American people, this problem would all go away. But what it misses, Mr. Mr. President, is the fact that the real issue here in Washington, D.C. isn't that we tax too little, it's that we spend too much. Washington has a spending problem that needs to be corrected. And at least the House of Representatives put forward a budget plan that addressed the fundamental problems that plague our nation's uh, fiscal situation. If you look at uh, what we're facing in terms of uh, obligations, liabilities, responsibilities in the years in the future, Medicare, Social Security, uh, Medicaid, other programs continue to grow at two or three times the rate of inflation. That's not sustainable. That is going to lead us to bankruptcy. We are on a, an unsustainable fiscal path. The trajectory that we're on today cannot be sustained over time. And yet we haven't seen any proposal put forward by the Democrats here in the Senate not just for this last year, but the year before that and the year before that. Three years and four months now since the Democrats in the Senate have put a, a budget on the floor of the United States Senate that we would have an opportunity to vote on and to give the American people at least an idea about where we want to lead this country. And so when they come down here hour after hour, day after day, night after night, attacking the House pass budget, I think the American people have got to say, and, and to, the, to, the, to the Democrats here in the United States Senate, where is your plan? Where is your budget? Show us what, would, what you would do. Show us how you would address the fiscal crisis that we're facing here in this country. The answer is, there isn't one. It's nada. It's zero. There's no plan. There's no budget. There hasn't been. Not this year, not the year before, and not the year before that. For three years and four months now, there hasn't been a budget put on the floor of the United States Senate for us to vote on, for us to amend, for us to discuss, for us to have any kind of uh, conversation about the future of this country and what we're going to do to address the fiscal crisis that we all acknowledge exists. This is the most predictable crisis, as has been pointed out, in American history. We all know where we're headed. You can look at the numbers. It, it's, it's, not, it's not complicated. It's not rocket science. It's simply a function of math. And the math is working against us. And every day that we wait, it becomes more complicated, more difficult, more problematic for us to solve this problem. And it further threatens the future and puts at risk our children and grandchildren and the quality of life and the standard of living that they're going to experience and enjoy in their lifetimes. So when the ratings agencies like Moody's come out and say that this fiscal cliff, if we go over it, means that a downgrade in the credit rating of the United States. When you have uh, organizations like the World Economic Forum say that the United States is now seventh when it comes to global competitiveness as opposed to first, which is where we were when the president took office, we all should take notice. It is yet another flashing red light. It is another warning sign. It's a red flag, if you will, that things are not well here in the United States of America. And yet the only proposal that has been put forward that would address that is the budget passed by the House of Representatives. Why? Because the United States Senate, again, has not passed a budget. We haven't produced a budget now for over three years. And it's interesting because one of my Democrat colleagues who was down here talking on the floor earlier this week described the budget as a set of values in attacking the House passed budget that somehow the House passed budget uh, represented the wrong values, didn't represent somehow American values. Well, if a budget represents a set of values, what does it mean then 
when you don't have one? If you don't have a budget, what does that say about your values? It seems to me at least, Mr. President, that at least the House of Representatives, to their credit, has put forward a proposal that whether you agree with it or not, does address the fundamental problems that we have as a nation, and that is out of control, uh, federal spending, a trajectory with regard to entitlement programs that literally will bankrupt the nation, a tax code that is overly complicated, that needs to be reformed. Those were all addressed in the House budget. And a lot of people have attacked the whole idea in the House budget with regard to, to Medicare reform, uh, which is referred to as premium support. Well, premium support is not a new idea. It's something that was popularized by uh, liberal think tanks years ago. Um, and in fact, uh, this year, the House proposed idea when it comes to premium support was something that was advanced by Representative Paul Ryan and by Senator Ron Wyden here in the United States Senate. It was a bipartisan idea. It was also something that was advocated by the uh, Rivlin Domenici task force that looked at our fiscal situation, made recommendations, and when it came to the idea of or the, uh, the notion of how to reform Medicare, premium support was something that was put forward as something that could be a new idea that could save the government, the taxpayers' money, money introduce competition in the same way that the Medicare Part D program has introduced competition and actually saved uh, money over what was it, it was proposed to cost. It, it's not a, a new idea. It is an idea that has been tried. When Medicare Part D was adopted, the premium support concept was including as part of that. And, uh, and you can see the results of that have led to lower cost, much lower cost than what was predicted. And that's frankly, Mr. President, I believe, because it introduced the idea, the element of competition into the whole uh, way that we deliver health care services under Medicare. Well, that's something that was proposed and built upon, developed, as part of the budget that was passed in the House of Representatives. But again, it's something that's uh, not new around here. It's, bad. it's had lots of support in the past from Democrats. It seems to me, at least, that if we know what we've got today isn't working, we ought to be willing to at least entertain a discussion and a conversation about some ideas that actually might solve the problem and might work. Yet here in the United States Senate for three years, uh, we have not had a budget. Now, some would argue that, uh, you know, that the President of the United States has put forward a budget, and in fact, as a matter of, um, I guess, just delivering a, a piece of, you know, or, or a, a, a set of papers to the Congress, he did do that. Um, but I would argue, and I think most would agree, that it wasn't a serious effort. It certainly wasn't a meaningful attempt to address the issue of spending and debt or entitlement reform or tax reform. And that was evidenced by the fact that it was, when it was put on the floor here in the United States Senate to be voted on, it was defeated by a vote of 97 to 0. And the previous year, the House of Representatives had a vote on the President's budget. That year, it was voted down in the House by something like 419 or 420 to 0. The President's budget for two consecutive years here in the Congress hasn't received one vote from any Democrat in either the House or the Senate. Now, that should speak volumes about the President's attempt to do this. And I think what it suggests is that it was not serious. It didn't make a, a real effort at trying to address the issues of spending and debt and getting the economy growing again and reforming our tax code and driving down the cost of doing business in this country instead of increasing the cost, which is something that seems to be happening every single day here. I hear as I travel across my state of South Dakota, as I listen to businesses from other parts of the country, the thing you hear over and over and over again is that the cost of doing business in this country is making us uncompetitive. We continue to be saddled with regulations, with requirements, with mandates, with taxes, and, and those sorts of things, the red tape of doing business in this country is making it incredibly difficult for our small businesses and our job creators to, keep, to get this economy back on its feet and get it growing again. And so I, I would simply say, uh, Mr. President, that in response to the attacks that have been leveled by my colleagues on the other side on the proposal that was advanced and put forward by the House Republicans, that it would bode them, I think, to, if you want to have a debate about priorities, if you want to have a debate about values, and if you want to have a debate about budgets, you have to have one. It starts with a budget. We don't have one. We don't have any plan for how we're going to deal with the very factors, the very elements that led organizations like Moody's and organizations like the World Economic Forum to determine that the United States credit rating is in jeopardy, and that our global competitiveness has dropped from first in the world to seventh. Those are things that I think we ought to be talking about. 
And you can't start talking about those things unless you have a plan, unless you have a budget that describes what you would do to address the drivers of federal spending, the drivers of federal debt. And again, Mr. President, I, I, can't, I can't emphasize this enough. The only thing I hear coming out of my colleagues on the other side to address it is we need more revenues. We need to raise taxes. We don't have enough revenue. If we just raise more revenue, we, revenues, we could solve all of these problems. Well, I would again say to my colleagues that what we have fundamentally here in Washington, D.C. is not a revenue issue. We have a spending problem. Washington doesn't tax too little. It spends too much. And that's why we need to get the spending under control, but it starts with the budget. And I think it's a, it, it would behoove um, our colleagues on the other side as they come down here day after day and berate and attack uh, and uh, suggest somehow that the budget that was passed by the House of Representatives is not representative of American values that they come down here with something of their own that might lay out a plan that actually does address Medicare reform, uh, Medicaid reform, tax reform, the things that we know have to be dealt with in the future if we're going to hand a better and more prosperous and stronger, stronger nation to our children and our grandchildren. That simply hasn't happened. And, and they can come down here and say what they want, but there isn't any, there's, when there's no budget, there is no blueprint, there is no plan, there is no path forward that addresses these, these difficult, complicated uh, challenges and problems that face us and face our nation in the future. And so I hope that we will eventually see that. I hope that the president will come to the table and that we can sit down and, and talk about how we are going to solve the fiscal cliff that we're headed over at the end of this year. And, uh, and, and, and again, it's not just the credit rating, it's just not global competitiveness, it is the American economy that's at stake as well. The Congressional Budget Office has said that if we go over this fiscal cliff, that where taxes go up on January 1st, where these cuts, these disproportionate cuts take effect on the military budget, that we're looking at a, an economic recession next year, a contraction in the economy of up to 2.9 percent, and unemployment above 9 percent. This is, this is about America's standing, it's about our credit rating, it's about our competitiveness, and it's about jobs in the economy, fundamentally. And it is high time that we had uh, help and cooperation and uh, an idea, perhaps, from the other side about how they would solve these problems. I hope we will get that, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. First, I know that Senator Grassley is on the floor, and I want to thank him for the courtesy to allow me to go next. Uh, Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent that I could speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I take this time on behalf of Maryland farmers. Uh, they're hurting, along with many farmers around the nation, because of the devastation from the drought. I'm t talking on behalf of uh, the poultry farmers, as, a, uh, as the presiding officer knows, and the Delmarva Peninsula. Uh, the impact that they've had from the drought on the corn crop, making it extremely difficult to, to make ends meet. Talking about dairy farmers in Western Maryland, uh, we have a, a robust agricultural uh, com uh, community. It's one of the largest parts of our economy, and that's true in just about every state in the nation. Uh, we have seen the worst drought in 50 years. It's affecting 42 states in this union. This is widespread, and Congress needs to act. The first thing we should do, Mr. President, is encourage our colleagues in the House of Representatives uh, to take up and pass the farm bill that we have passed. That was a bipartisan bill. It was a bill that was debated in this chamber. It's a bill that would help our agricultural community uh, through, uh, to get through uh, this uh, crisis uh, brought about by extreme weather. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the Farm Bill was a bipartisan effort. It dealt with many components that would help segments of our agricultural community as a result of the conditions from the drought. Let me just mention a few. The livestock disaster provision that expired in 2011, in the Farm Bill, it is strengthened. It's made retroactive back to 2012, and it would help uh, those that are in the cattle producing uh, part of agriculture will get through the conditions of this drought. Seventy-two percent of the cattle producing areas are affected by the drought. Seventy-two percent. 
It's going to have an effect on our entire country. We have a responsibility to make sure that our farm policies help the get through this unusually disastrous weather conditions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and the presiding officer knows from Delaware, the poultry industry has suffered unbelievably. The reason, quite frankly, is that, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, the price to produce a chick in the poultry industry is so much dependent upon the price of feed or corn. And the corn price is, is, is extremely high uh, as a result, uh, in part, uh, of the drought conditions. The farm bill that we passed would help the corn producers, which would, in fact, would help the poultry industry. So it's an important part of, of the farm bill. For my fruit and vegetable growers, the reform in the crop insurance program would help them uh, during these very tough times. And then let me mention the conservation programs. I know, I know that Chairman Stabenow has talked about this frequently on the floor, but the farm bill we passed reforms the conservation programs that allow our farmers to do the right thing. One of the things we learned from the Dust Bowl, from the crisis that we confronted in the 1930s, was that you've got to take care and protect your water and your soil. You need to be attentive to water and soil. Well, after the, the Dust Bowl, after the, that crisis, we passed in the Congress uh, different types of conservation acts. Well, the farm bill that we passed in this House con consolidates, reforms, and strengthens the conservation programs so that our farmers can do the right thing, not only for producing today, but for producing tomorrow, taking care of, of the circumstances that we know Mother Nature will be throwing at us. Well, we can't do anything about that until the House takes up the Farm Bill, and they have yet to take it up. I would just urge my colleagues in the other body to take this bill up. We, we need to do that for many reasons, one of which, of course, is the extreme conditions that the agricultural community in this country is confronting as a result uh, of this drought. Let me talk specifically about poultry. Uh, on the Delmarva Peninsula, the poultry industry is in crisis. It's in crisis. The senator from Delaware, the presiding officer, understands this. Seventy-five percent of the cost to produce poultry is in the price of feed. The, the, what the uh, poultry industry uses for feed is corn. That is what they need to have, corn. At the present time, corn is approaching $9 a barrel. What does that mean? Well, if the price is at that rate, it would cost about $2 per pound to produce a chick for market. The retail price is $2 a pound. It doesn't take too much of of an economic background to know that you can't make it under those economic conditions. Our poultry industry needs help. They need to be competitive, uh, and it's difficult to do that when they're so dependent upon uh, the price of corn. Uh, the problem with corn is that we're competing uses. It's not only used in the food chain, it's used as an energy source as a result of corn-based ethanol. That distorts the food chain. I have introduced legislation along with Senator Bozeman and Senator Mikulski that would modify the renewable fuel standards. That's the standards that require a certain percentage of our renewables in corn ethanol. It would modify that, and let me explain how. It would link the amount of corn ethanol required for the renewable fuel standards to the amount of corn supply. That makes sense. As we have more corn, fine, we can meet the renewable standards. But in this type of, in this year, where we've had a drought condition, we have much less corn, the price of corn is going up in price, making it very dis difficult for our poultry industry, the requirements would be reduced. We think that makes sense. That's using market forces uh, to help meet our energy needs, but also to help deal with the realities of uh, the, the poultry industry. I've also joined with Senator Hagan and Senator Champless Pryor Boozman uh, in, in authoring a letter to the Environmental Protection Agency uh, calling for them to waive the renewable fuel standards conventional ethanol product mandate for this year. 
Uh, again, let the farmers be able to compete. Don't let us distort the marketplace. So, Mr. President, let me just say, in summary, agriculture is critically important to this country for many reasons. It's one of the largest parts of our economy. It's important for our national security. It's part of our way of life. We lead the world in, in, in the productivity in agriculture. It has a, it's important for us in international trade. All these reasons. But we need to be tentative to how we deal with agriculture in this country. We need a farm policy, an agricultural policy. The farm bill we passed is necessary to be enacted or we're going to have a lapse in our agricultural programs. We've done our work. It's critically important before this, the House goes home that they take up the farm bill. I hope they would pass our farm bill in order to help farmers in Maryland and around the nation. And then I would hope we would also pay special attention to the poultry industry to recognize that because of the uh, cost of the price of corn related not just to the food chain but also energy that we have a responsibility to help the, the poultry industry which is so dependent upon corn as a commodity to produce uh, the poultry product. Uh, we need to help our agricultural community to do the right thing. It's important for our country and I would urge my colleagues to pay attention to these issues before we uh, recess uh, for the fall elections. With that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Iowa. I come to the floor to discuss the state of our economy and to give some suggestions on how to improve it. But before I go to the purp main purpose I came, uh, I want to say to the Senator from Maryland that I agree with him that the House of Representatives ought to take up a farm bill, and I hope that they will, and that's my urging. I would also like to take advantage of the opportunity to explain a little bit about ethanol and how that works in with the situation he brought up about increasing uh, feed for uh, chickens or any other animals. Uh, this year, farmers planted 96 million acres of corn. More acres planted to corn than any other year since 1938. Uh, and most of that's because of the ethanol industry. Uh, if we didn't have an ethanol industry, we would normally plant somewhere between 80 and 85 million acres of corn. So let's just assume that you never heard of the word ethanol or the product ethanol, and it didn't even exist and farmers planted the usual 80 to 85 million acres of corn. And we had the same drought that we have this year over about two-thirds of the United States. And the corn crop is going to be really reduced because of it. Uh, and uh, if you planted 80 to 85 million acres of corn, and we had the same drought, you'd still have the high price of grain that we have right now, but you wouldn't have ethanol to blame for it. So the marketplace is bringing about the increased production of corn because of feed, fuel, and fiber. And, uh, and uh, you, you should not be scapegoating ethanol because if we didn't have ethanol to blame, we wouldn't be planting uh, 95, 96 million acres of corn. We'd be planting about 80 to 85 million acres of corn, uh, and we'd still have the same problem, the same high price, the same problem for the poultry producers. Now to the point that I came to the Senate. We all recognize that our nation faces challenging times. We've had years with unemployment at unacceptable levels and anemic economic growth that shows no sign of lifting us out of the situation. Meanwhile, rampant government spending, 
which we were promised would jumpstart the economy and create jobs, has instead displaced private sector investment and choked off job creation. More and more Americans are starting to doubt that their children and grandchildren will have better opportunities than they had, not to mention the fact that they will be forced to pay for all of that spending. We keep being told by President Obama and members of his party that change is just around the corner. If we just keep doing what we are doing, things will get better. After almost four years of failed policy and dashed hopes, that line is wearing thin. Fortunately, our problems are not insurmountable, and the solutions are common sense. All that is needed is sufficient leadership to make the tough decisions. In fact, this is the same situation that Great Britain faced in the 1970s. Britain was mired in debt and even had to go to the IMF for a bailout. Successive British prime ministers had recognized a looming financial problem for years, but failed to get the budget under control. At that time, in the 1970s, Britain was known as the sick man of Europe. Still, as in this country, interest groups that benefited from public spending threatened to bring down any British government that even considered measures to control spending. We see those same forces in the Congress of the United States telling us that you can't cut any place. In fact, Britain did face massive strikes in the winter of 78 to 79, better known as the winter of discontent. As a result of the inability of several different prime ministers to take the difficult steps necessary to turn things around, many pundits started to speculate that Britain had become ungovernable. There were even many British politicians who had decided that the best they could accomplish was to manage the economic and political decline of America. And we hear the terms in the United States of a new norm. I hope we aren't getting into that same attitude that the British had in the 1970s. But they had a leader that came along by the name of Mar Margaret Thatcher. She utterly rejected the notion that decline was an option. In fact, she was famous for repeating the phrase, quote, there is no alternative, end of quote. So I would like to take those words, there is no alternative, as a guiding point for us in the Congress, Republican or Democrat, that we've got to do something. There is no alternative. By this, Prime Minister Thatcher meant that government control of major parts of the economy and an economic policy based on uncontrolled spending had failed. If economic recovery was the goal, the only alternative was the free market. This meant cutting spending, reducing growth inhibiting income taxes, and reining in government micromanagement of business. Things you hear from the private sector in the United States today. Despite the hard lessons of experience, the prevailing economic theory of the day still held that government spending was good for the economy and that government central planners could operate more efficiently than the private business left, left alone. Now that's the situation she was describing in Britain. But for us here, whether it's government or the private sector. It's like saying, are 535 members of Congress smarter to determine the direction of the economy, or is the 308 million people outside of the Congress in the United States better prepared to do it, and which will do the most good? 
Now, Thatcher faced intense op opposition, both from true believers in the stimulus ideology and from those with a vested interest in the status quo. But having rejected national decline as she did as an option, there really was no alternative. <coughs> she explained to the British public why her course of action was necessary and stood up to the special interest that stood in the way of prosperity. And we hear from our constituents about those special interests that we ought to do something about, but we don't seem to do much about it. When the media began speculating that she would fail to follow through and that she would lose her spine and make a U-turn like so many of her predecessors, Mrs. Thatcher's response was, quote, you turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. End of quote. What Prime Minister Thatcher provided for Britain is very simple, leadership. And that's exactly what the United States needs today. Most Americans I talk to believe in our opportunity society and refuse to accept that the American dream of a better life for our children is dead, or that there's a new norm, or that America is in decline. For those of us who feel that way, restoring the dynamic American free market economy is essential. In the words of Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. We must reduce spending. There is no alternative. We must have low, simple, and stable taxes. There is no alternative. And there is no alternative to reducing and reforming the growing regulatory burden. During the last three and a half years, the national debt has grown by more than $5 trillion, an increase of 50 percent. This year will be the fourth consecutive year with trillion-dollar annual deficits. These deficits in a federal debt that now totals $16 trillion are, in fact, dampers on the private sector job creation. When Washington takes and spends the wealth created in the private sector, it crowds out new investments that would have been made by businesses and entrepreneurs, investments that would have resulted in the creation of new wealth and job opportunities for more Americans. The out-of-control spending has created a stagnant economy with unemployment stuck above 8 percent now for 42 consecutive months. Economic freedom must replace bigger government. Economic growth must be our top priority. And fiscal discipline in Washington is a prerequisite to sustainable economic growth. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. The four-year experiment attempting to increase economic prosperity by growing government and managing the economy through government intervention has failed. To address the anemic economic recovery and get America back to work, we must reduce the sky size and scope of the federal government. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. Again, our nation is $16 trillion in debt. And how much is $16 trillion? Well, if you started counting to $16 trillion one second at a time, it would take you over 500,000 years to reach that level. The federal government will spend more than $11 trillion just on Medicare and Medicaid over the next 10 years. Medicare and Medicaid serve a vital role in providing health care services to individuals who are poor, elderly, and disabled. But just because those programs have operated a certain, certain way for 47 years doesn't mean they operate efficiently, even though we all agree that they're part of the social fabric of America and must be maintained. If we want to save those programs for the future generations, the current path of just saying no 
to every proposal and every special interest is not an option. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. There is no alternative but to look at their very structure and ask the question, can we do better? As we begin to take the steps to pull ourselves out of this fiscal mess, we also need to reform how Washington does business so that we don't find ourselves in this situation again. One major step that could produce long-term fiscal discipline is a balanced budget amendment. But if we pass that today, it won't get us out of the hole we're in, but once you get out of the hole, it's going to keep us from getting into it again. The national debt now is reaching a point of where, if we do not intervene with a constitutional amendment for a balanced budget, it is going to become unsustainable. Mere laws have not controlled deficit spending because Congress can always change a law when it becomes politically expedient. And I went through this one time because I was an author with a former senator in this body by the name of Harry Byrd from the state of Virginia, not West Virginia. He and I worked together when I was a member of the House. We got a legislation passed requiring a balanced budget. But for 15 years, that law, that while it was on the books, and never in those 15 years was there ever a balanced budget. So it makes it very clear that statutes will not control deficit spending. I concluded a long time ago that a constitutional amendment is a must to provide Congress with necessary discipline. The example right now of Europe's debt situation is sobering. Nations that allow debt to grow out of control risk default. Think of Greece as an example. If we do not take effective correction, corrective action, the European future could be ours and maybe sooner than we think. The time for tinkering around the edges of the budget is over. We must take bold action to address the debt crisis before it's too late. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. Another area crying out for decisive action is our voluminous tax code. Uncertainty in our tax code and the threat of higher taxes is really like an anchor preventing our economy from setting sail. At the end of the year, the across-the-board tax relief first enacted in 2001 and 2003 will expire. Its expiration will lead to a higher tax bill for virtually every taxpayer, representing one of the largest tax increases in the history of the country. And as you know, that can happen without even a vote of Congress. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke has testified about the negative impact of higher taxes on a fragile economy. More importantly, I hear from employers that uncertainty about the future makes it difficult to plan, take risk, and make decisions to expand and hire. Tax certainty must be a priority in creating a pro-growth environment. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. Even President Obama has acknowledged the negative impact of tax increases on economic growth, saying that you shouldn't raise taxes in a recession. You remember, he campaigned on tax increases in 2008, but before he's even sworn in, he warned the people that we can't have that tax increase now because we're in a recession. Nevertheless, nearly every day our president is on the campaign trail in 2010 or 2012 talking about tax increases on the so-called rich, claiming them to pay their fair share. But I've never had a definition from the president of the United States of what a fair share is. However, the so-called rich already pay overwhelming majority of federal taxes. Do you know that the top 20% of households currently account for 95% uh, of federal income taxes. Moreover, the top 1% we hear so much about 
bears nearly 40 percent of the federal income tax burden. It is no wonder our job sector, especially the nearly one million small businesses targeted by the president's tax increase, are reluctant to make business decisions and invest in this climate when taxes are going to go so high at the end of this year. There are businesses ready to expand and create jobs. There are millions of dollars in the private sector investment waiting to be invested and create jobs. But businesses are holding back, waiting for the heavy boot of higher taxes to drop. It's time that we replace divisiveness and demagoguery with a pro-growth tax policy. This country does not need more taxes. We need more taxpayers. And the way to get more taxpayers is to get more people working. And the way to get more people working is to encourage that investment. Take the uncertainty out of the present economic or out of the political environment here that has an impact on the economy. When businesses and entrepreneurs are willing to put everything on the line by opening a new business or expanding an existing business, we must assure them that they will be able to enjoy the fruits of their success, not punish them with a higher tax bill, which takes money out of their cash flow, and when you operate on cash flow, you can't hire people if you don't have the cash. So we must act decisively to stop job-killing taxes from going up. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. It isn't just the threat, though, of taxes that has caused uncertainty and held back private sector investment. The threat of costly new regulations has paralyzed many industries. In fact, from small business, I hear more complaints about the regulation than I do this biggest tax increase in the history of the country coming before us this December. During the past few years, thousands of new federal rules were finalized. Those who view government intervention into private enterprise has, as positive might say, so what? But all these rules come with real costs. This administration has issued about 200 major rules that each have an impact of $100 million or more. A Gallup poll taken at the end of last year found that compliance with government regulations is the single biggest issue facing small business owners today. When 70 percent of the new jobs in America are created by small business, we ought to be concerned about what these small business people are saying is their number one problem. On top of the outright cost of new regulation and the compliance burden, the uncertainty about when a new regulation might come down makes businesses reluctant to expand. In recent years, we have seen regulation on top of regulation. No one knows when the next one will appear or how much it will cost. During the Great Depression, the avalanche of new agencies with newfound regulatory powers led businesses sitting on large amounts of cash, even in industries that were not yet affected by the new regulations, because the uncertainty about who would be targeted next froze private sector investment. Now, we're seeing pretty much the same thing today. We would be, uh, it would be one thing if these were essential protections for the environment or public health, as proponents often claim, but for many of these new regulations, the cost of compliance outweighs the public benefit. Does it make any sense to try to regulate dust on farms when there's no practical way to stop the wind blowing? But I don't know how many years the EPA's work, been working on what they call a fugitive dust rule. Does it make any sense to make a dairy farmer fill out pages of documents to prove that they have a plan in place in the case of an accidental milk spill? Well, they considered that regulation, but it, it was too uh, outlandish 
that they made a public announcement they weren't going to do that. Then why was EPA wasting time considering these regulations in the first place? There are legitimate forms of pollution that need attention, but even then, the EPA, EPA seems intent upon overkill. Did the uti utility MAC rule, which was intended to limit mercury emissions from power plants, really need to be the single most expensive regulation in EPA history? In addition to this rule, power plants that rely on coal, like most of those in my state of Iowa, are facing a whole new a string of overlapping rules with their own compliance deadlines and paperwork. These rules, uh, these include the cross-state air pollution rule, the national ambient air quality standards, regulation of greenhouse gas emissions, cooling water intake regulations, clean water affluent guidelines, and coal ash regulations. Taken separately, each of these may have some justification, but when you put them all together, the cost and the compliance burden is enormous, especially on small utilities. And just yesterday, there was a delegation of Iowa Rural Electric Cooperatives in my office explaining just exactly how costly this was to them and their consumers. That leads many people to suspect that the real motivation for this burst of regulations is an ideological drive to artificially raise the cost of electricity generation using coal, which would hurt the economies in places like Iowa that rely on coal for cost-effective energy. The regulatory approach that imposes excessive costs for little or no benefit does not do anyone any good. Regulatory agencies should be held accountable for meeting the cost-benefit test and also a little more difficult to measure, but the common sense test. The deluge of regulations in recent years and the uncertainty, there's that word again, uncertainty, about what is coming next is acting like a wet blanket on our economy. We must put an immediate stop to the unnecessary, unnecessary costly new regulations. In the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. In the long run, we need comprehensive regulatory reform. The Constitution vests all legislative powers in Congress, which is directly accountable to the American people. However, over the years, Congress has delegated more and more authority to unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats. And once delegated, it's difficult to take back. As a result, then, we have a massive administrative state full of well-meaning but unelected government officials who have great power to write regulations with the force of law with little or no democratic accountability. This has led to the implementation of major policy decisions that impact the economy and the lives of the American people that likely would never have been approved if they would have had to been voted upon by the Congress. That's why I'm an original co-sponsor of the regulation from uh, the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act, RAINS uh, is the uh, acronym R-E-I-N-S, the RAINS Act would require every major federal regulation to come before both houses of Congress for a vote and be signed by the President before it can be implemented. This will allow voters to hold their members of Congress accountable for ill-conceived regulations. And it would be a check on the mistake that Congress makes by delegating so much power in the first place. It would also provide more transparency and predictability to the regulatory process, thus reducing job-killing uncertainty. Reforms such as the RAINS Act would be a major change in how Washington does business 
and that upsets a lot of apple carts. And in the words of Prime Minister Thatcher, there is no alternative. If we want economic growth and jobs, if we want a brighter future for America, we can't afford to dither any longer. We need leadership like Britain had under Margaret Thatcher, that's willing to tell all the special interests and all the political power players there is no alternative. We must take steps I have outlined to reinvigorate the free market economy. Just like Britain in 1979, there is no alternative. We have tried President Obama's theory on economic stimulus, supposed to keep unemployment under 8 percent, and it's never been under 8 percent since the day he signed it. We saw a massive expansion of government deficit spending as a result. More than $800 billion was spent on failed economic stimulus bill that was supposed to keep unemployment down. We all know how that turned out. Government spending in the process has reached unprecedented levels. Today, the size of government, if you combine local, state, and federal, is 40 percent of our gross national product. 100 years ago, it was 8 percent. If it were true that government spending creates economic growth, then we should be living high off the hog today. But it is not. The private sector creates jobs. It is the responsibility of the government to merely create an environment that leads to job growth. Remember a very basic premise. Government consumes wealth. It doesn't create wealth. Through economic freedom, entrepreneurs are free to innovate and prosper. This economic success leads to higher standards of living and a better quality of life. Importantly, these gains do not then come at the expense of others. Because contrary to what some around here would have you believe, when someone produces a product or a service that others want, they're creating new wealth and everyone is better off. But too often around here, we think matters of the economy are a zero-sum game. One person's prosperity then does not come at the expense of another's. In fact, business success and economic growth lifts all boats through employment gains, higher wages, greater value to the consumer. We sometimes hear it implied that individual success cannot be achieved without government involvement or intervention. Some people seem to believe that an individual's success must come at somebody else being deprived, or that success was only achieved collectively and with the help of government. This line of thinking concludes that government and society is therefore entitled to some of the fruits of individual's labor. This line of thinking is in stark contradiction to our country's founding principles that government exists to protect individuals' right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness isn't found in a government paycheck redistribu redistributing what somebody else earned. In fact, government dependence leads to resentment. By contrast, this great American dream of ours is based on individual Americans working hard and learning and earning their own success. A country with an increasing number of citizens dependent upon government that lives beyond its means and redistributes what remains of a once great economy would then cease to be the great America that we've had for 225 years. Such a future is unacceptable to most Americans, just like it was unacceptable to a Prime Minister Thatcher, who said there is no alternative. The American dream is our birthright and our obligation to posterity. We must return to pro-growth policies and an opportunity society. There is no alternative. I yield the floor.
and I'd like to have you use 